books on prescription. Now it's interesting, this morning when Miriam was talking, she was talking about power and influence and how it's important to speak to the uh, decision makers in an organisation with power and influence. Now, as chair of this community of practice, I would have assumed that I would have quite a bit of power and influence. So it makes me wonder how I ended up with the afternoon snooze slot for my presentation. But there we go. Um, so I'm going to be talking about kind of books on prescription with families. Before we get into talking about that, I wanted us to think about how this fits with CYPI Act. So as you heard this morning, these are my five CYPI Act givens. And you've heard about why I kind of chose Gibbons, and I want to think about how doing something like self-help books on prescription could be helpful with IAPT. So here we have our five key priorities, accountability, awareness, accessibility, participation, and evidence-based practice. Now in thinking about books on prescription, the two clear things I think they help with is first of all the awareness given, and second of all the evidence price evidence-based practice given, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. But also, there's, there's the opportunities which I'll refer to for how we can use books on prescription in a participatory way with young people and with parents. So coming back to evidence-based practice, um, Miriam shared a wonderful slide this morning that talked about the complexities of evidence-based practice. Mine's a bit more simplified. So when I use the phrase evidence-based practice, I'm thinking about it in two ways. First of all, we have the evidence from randomised controlled trials, which give us a, an idea about the styles of working that have been shown to be effective for particular kind of problems. It's those, that kind of evidence which has informed the sort of courses that IACT have been offering, whether it's cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT for anxiety and depression, or parent training for conduct problems in young people. Okay? So that's one kind of evidence. There's also another kind of evidence, and it is evidence from experimental research on children, young people and families with specific presenting problems. That allows us to form models of how these problems work and also think about how we can share understanding. And it's in that second sense of evidence-based practice that I think books on prescription work really well. There's something else I wanted to highlight as well, something called practice-based evidence. Okay. What this means is it's where services use systematic data collection and the conclusions of reflective practice to inform service delivery and development. So while you heard this morning about use of outcome measures and feedback tools um, in a collaborative way, there's also real benefits for a service that when you're doing this systematically, you can begin to learn what your service does well at, what it does less well at, and where you can target future training resources. In terms of this practice-based evidence, we've been running um, books on prescription for nine years in East Sussex, and this is the kind of evidence we've collected. First of all, it comes from library issue figures. Now, one of the interesting things about working on books on prescription with the library is you learn all this kind of library jargon, which I wasn't familiar with. To me, issues was something that Tony Benn used to talk about, but apparently what issues mean is if a book is renewed, or kind of taken out. So we've had data from that, which I'll present in a while. We've run 18 staff focus groups, 35 staff interviews. We've got six years of our steering group minutes. We've had resource reviews from, this is just in my practice, 64 young people and 58 parent carers. And also I've had 10 years experience of supervising people using books on prescription. So that's the data that we're gonna have. Um, so I wanna, think a bit more broadly about books on prescription, but I want to start by just being transparent about my kind of investment in books on prescription. <clears throat> in the 1990s, I was referred to um, local mental health services, and most of the support I got was pretty useless, actually. I spent most of the time on a waiting list, but the most useful thing I got, I was given at the first appointment, and that was a recommendation of Dorothy Rowe's book, Breaking the Bonds, and that was really valuable to me. And actually, yesterday, putting this together, I'm still aware that that book continues to resonate with me. Not because it had any advice, but because it kind of contained wisdom. And I think in this age where we're information rich, we're actually wisdom poor. So that was really valuable to me. So that's kind of the prejudice I bring into this and where I come from. Um, so in setting up the East Sussex Books on Prescription, 
we learned lessons from history. So back in the 40s, it was pointed out that um, if you're going to be using self-help texts, it's important to have close cooperation between the physician, the librarian, and the family. And that's why we set up a steering group to oversee the project. Crucial to any books on prescription scheme is the integrity and relevance of the books that you recommend. So back in 1916, there was a report of using um, the proceedings of the US Congress and getting patients to read them. Fortunately, books on prescription has moved on. And what we had in East Sussex was a rigorous process of peer review to checking the best possible um, texts are recommended. And the leaflet that's before you that I will talk about has gone through that same rigorous peer review process. So when you recommend one of these books, you know <coughs> that it's informed by the evidence and has real quality behind it. So where did books on prescription start? Well, it was a very ambitious beginning. The ancient library at Thebes famously had an inscription as you walk in as a healing place for the soul. However, smaller claims have been made for modern psychological therapies, which Freud tells us can only transform neurotic misery into ordinary unhappiness. Fortunately, ordinary unhappiness is not a great pitch when you're trying to sell therapies. Um, and over history, you know, a lot of therapists have uh, ambivalence towards the medical model. But actually, books on prescription are not, has often played with this metaphor and has done for the past 80 years. However, just stepping back from books on prescription, I think it's important to think about them in the context of being a skilled helper working with families. And I think when um, people come to CAMS, there's two very powerful stories that start to operate. The first is that there's something wrong with the child, and the second is that there's something wrong with the parents. And all participants get positioned by these stories. And what I would say is goodwill is not enough to kind of avoid these stories. You know, uh, the clinic room isn't hermetically sealed from the rest of culture. Culture gets reproduced there. And what I often say to trainees and therapists, if you're not paying attention to these stories, the chances are you might be reproducing them, either in what you say, or in your non-verbal communication, or in the silences that you allow to happen in the session. So let's start off with these, um, there's something wrong with the child, what I call within-child explanations. And these are very popular in public discourse. So there's, uh, there's a common myth that somehow um, mental health problems in children or adults are called, caused by faulty brains through brain dysfunction or chemical imbalances. There's actually very little evidence to support that. We also have the discourse about genetic determinism. Um, so for example, here's a quote from the Daily Mail, ADHD, genes to blame, not parents. Obviously, the Daily Mail really pleased it's got someone to blame, even if it is just organic matter. And this is not just in um, public discourse. Uh, sorry, let me just go back to this. Actually, this Daily Mail article, when you root down into it, it was drawing on evidence from twin studies. And twin studies do show that identical twins have greater level of symptoms than non-identical twins. So that was the evidence they were using. However, what we know from... These, we know these studies are problematic because identical twins have more similar environments to non-identical twins and therefore the uh, similar presentation in symptoms could be to do with the similar environments rather than to do with their genetics. And actually these kind of twin studies have been used to show the quote-unquote heredity of loneliness, frequency of orgasm in women and breakfast eating patterns. So we need to treat them with a bit of caution. However, these stories are not just cultural myths. I mean, for example, uh, pres uh, prescribing for children and young people has massively shifted over the t last 20 years. And if you look at this, this is um, the frequency of prescriptions for Ritalin that's used in the management of ADHD. We've got exponential growth on a scale we have never seen. And if you look, it's gone from about um, 5,000 in 1995 to over 900,000 in 2015. And that's why this has become a matter of public debate, in large part thanks to the Association of Educational Psychologists and also the House of Commons Health Select Committee. So these have cultural impacts, these stories. People are aware that they're in circulation. And we have also myths about kind of how medication works. So one of the ways we've gone about avoiding these within-child explanation is that 
When we present books on prescription and other forms of self-help, it's about promoting family resources rather than treating individual pathology. And what we've used is books for parents and carers, books for children to read with their parents, and guidebooks for youth. And in terms of the small number of diagnostic-driven texts, we only use them in highly specialised clinics. The second story, there's something wrong with the parents, parental blame. And this story goes like that child distress is somehow to do with parental failure. This idea of feeling judged and being judged by dom dominant norms and assumptions often filtered through the graces. The graces are stories of gender, race, ability, class, ethnicity and kind of sexuality. And these are very present. In fact, I would say these have intensified over the last 30 years, this kind of story. And as you'll see here, psychology has a rich tradition of blaming parents, particularly mothers. So, let's leave the cultural studies lecture, let's bring it back to the reality. And I want to tell you about Paul's story. And Paul was incredibly generous. He was the father of a family that I worked with. And he gave me permission to share his story, because he was really keen that um, people working with parents understood the challenges that he had faced so they wouldn't be replicated. So Paul was referred, well, Paul, uh, Paul's son, Calvin, was referred into my clinic with severe behavioural disturbance. And uh, Paul had been told for years if he could only get his son a diagnosis, that that would resolve everything. And he battled and battled with school, with his GP, and finally got to see a consultant paediatrician who did his assessment and said, actually, sorry, but your son doesn't meet diagnostic criteria. And this is Paul recounting this story to me. And Paul says, well, I said to him, what should I do? What should I do? This, I've been told this diagnosis would solve things, and here I am not getting the diagnosis. And the paediatrician said, I recommend this book to you, 123 Magic. And Paul said to me that he experienced that as an insult. Okay. I'll come back to why I experienced it as an insult. Just talking about this book. This is a really solid book. It involves a kind of sophisticated form of stick and carrot with a lot of love. It's based on experimental models. But to Paul, when the paediatrician suggested read this book, how he heard it was that, first of all, his difficulties had been trivialised. Oh, well, you just read a book and you kind of sort it out. And second, Paul said, that he didn't feel heard. He really needed support, and yet he was kind of being given a book. And what that shows is that when we start making recommendations, we're into the level of meaning, and we need to consider how these things are received. And I think part of this is that there's different kinds of giving advice. And that advice in the context of family power structures and other communal rituals is very different from the professional use of giving books on prescription. And uh, my uh, pictures there are meant to show that they're a different kettle of fish. <laughs> because this advice in the context of family and other power structures is based steeped in kind of family custom and practice. It's about um, using local knowledge to kind of pass on the insights and knowledge of parenthood. And as a parent myself, you know, what I discovered is that families are not backwards in coming forwards with suggestions about how you should look after your children. Um, and also that um, sharing wisdom and knowledge within families can have a really normalising effect in a way that's much more complicated when you do this with professionals. And then over the last uh, 50 years, but I would say particularly over the last 30 to 40 years, we've had the rise of professional knowledge and fashions that that um, reflects. And what this rise in professional knowledge in part reflects is the fact that families have become more fragmented. And that's to do with all sorts of things, such as the changing structure of the labour market, um, increasing social inequality, but also shifting sources of authority on parenting and anxiety is about getting it right. Now this is really different to my parents' generation, they experienced this quite differently. What I would say, and there's some evidence to back this up, is that since the 80s, this has got much more intense, particularly with um, the growth in consumerism and the manipulation of parenting uh, desires. It's very useful for the market, which has created all sorts of anxieties about being a parent. And modern parenthood is often structured around the demands of who we should be. Alongside this, we have a process referred to as the medicalisation of childhood. Um, Peter Conrad, who's actually been researching this for 40 years, this is his life work, 
I think the title of his book from 2007 says it all. The Medicalization of Society on the Transformation of the Human Condition into Treatable Disorders. So this is some of the background. And as clinicians working with parents, we have to su support and think in our work about how we navigate around the question of parental blame. So I guess one of my messages is that books do have side effects. They can add to the sense of failure and increase the marginalisation of family knowledge and resources that actually led to the referral. You have a danger sometimes that um, problems can become technicalised and therefore require experts which might sideline the family's knowledge. And books can also add to the lists of things that parents feel they're failing to live up to and their identity become problematised. So how have we used books on prescription in CAMs, specialist CAMs? As I'm sure most of you are, access to specialist CAMs is where problems are complex, persistent and have severe impact on daily functioning. We are a very small service. Uh, child mental health only gets 6% of the mental health budget. So when we use books on prescription, we use it in various ways. We might use it when somebody's referred to our service that doesn't meet the criteria and as part of that redirection process, we might recommend a resource. We might recommend it after assessment. And as well, you know, at the moment we have some lengthy wait lists. So while people are on the wait list, we might provide them with a self-help program to the young person or to the parents to be kind of working on. Um, I just want to change tack slightly. When I was running the uh, IAP supervision group, um, the two trainees that I was working with were really keen on self-help resources, really interested, found some great websites. I learned from that. But one of the things that used to come up in supervision is when they would make recommendations for self-help resources to parents, and the parents didn't take it up, they would become kind of quite frustrated, quite annoyed, and that would kind of come into supervision. And what I found really helpful at that point, to stop the conversation being moved by the emotion and to move into a more reflective space, was to invite the uh, supervisees to think about what the resources we need to make use of self-help information. And these were some of the ones we came up with, obviously literacy, time, organisation, application, structure, motivation and energy, a lot of motivation and energy. Let's face it, self-help books, Jack Kerouac, it ain't. You know, these are, these are hard books to kind of get through. I've had to review loads of them, so I know. It also needs a quiet space, support with understanding, self-awareness, space to reflect and kind of supportive environments. So in terms of what I've learned from practice using these books on prescription, it's important to focus on the relationship to knowledge rather than the use of particular strategies. How did you find that section of the book? So I'm more interested in stories about the reading rather than what's read. And I privilege reflective responses to the content rather than have they used them. I think confession is a really unhelpful ritual in helping, um, helping relationships. And also, and this is one of the things I have to talk to trainee therapists about, rejected suggestions can be as useful as accepted ones. And by that I mean if a parent says, well the book said to do that, but I didn't do it, I'm really interested in that disinclination. What's that about? What does it reflect about what matters to them as a parent that they don't want to do this thing? And then what's the history of that? Because my experience is that when parent choices are situated in their values and preferences as parents, it creates a much firmer foundation for action. So this is all a bit theoretical. Let me bring it back to um, Paul. So when I met with Paul, one of the things he talked about was this sense of failure because the text that he'd read, this magic one, two, three, talked about very firm discipline, particularly when leaving for school, which was a, a major challenge in their household. And what Paul said to me was, I just can't do that harsh father thing. And it would have been quite easy to stop at that point and leave it. But as we began to explore it, it turns out that his context was really significant. He talked about his own father's physically abusive and controlling stance. So how I began to understand Paul was using this idea called a, that he had a corrective script. Sorry, jargon alert. For those who are lucky enough to go on the systemic family practice course, you'll learn about these corrective scripts. And the idea is that for some parents, the story they bring into parenting might be, I've got to do it different from how I was parented. That's the corrective script. Okay? Now, corrective scripts can be mobilised in two ways. They can be mobilised flexibly, 
So you use them most of the time, but when the context doesn't allow it, you might shift into something else. For other people, they might be mobilised rigidly, so that you always have to do it. And this was the bind that Paul kind of found himself in. So, in exploring with Paul why he hadn't been able to use this text, he talked about the value he places on being close. Being close was the, was the highest context marker for his parenting relationship. And then, in the course of our discussions, I heard about an exception. He talked about when he challenged his son to stay at the table, the dining table at home, during family discussion of what happened in school. So I was really interested in this. So I started asking him about what kinds of discipline being close allowed. Because he could be close with Calvin, even though he's being firm at the table. And then that opened up other discussions about where else Paul could take this idea that being close doesn't prevent uh, being disciplined. So, coming back to the evaluation, for a number of years we monitored, by promoting this scheme to staff, what happened to library issue figures. And as you'll see, we went from about 600 um, as the scheme started, to now we're kind of over 3,000 issues, 3,000 times the books are being used. However, we need to develop this evidence base, because for 85 years we've been searching for evidence for books on prescription. Limited data is collected on effectiveness, there's lots more data as I've showed on usage. But the idea is isolating the key element. Because if somebody's referred into a service, they meet with a skilled helper, there's conversations about what's happening, what might make a difference, and that we also offer them a book. Which bit in that has been affected? That's quite hard to kind of pull out. And while we do collect qualitative feedback, this is often partial and subject to selection biases. So it's the old thing that you often hear about complainers and those that complement. Although I'd say about books on prescription, it's largely been from those who complement it. However, supported self-help packages are an emerging area of interest in the research community. 